You always make it though. That's my question. Yeah, I, I'm the chicken soup maker. Like my dad okay. definitely has, my mom definitely has, but I feel like over the years that's kind of become my assignment. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. Hello and welcome to Talking Too Loud with Chris Savage. I'm your host, Chris Savage. I'm joined today and always by Sylvie Lubau. And the airplanes. And the always the airplanes and no one working out above you right now. So yeah. congratulations to us. Check one box. <laughs> we'll try to check the other at some point. Um, we have a great guest today. Elizabeth O'Neill is with us. She's an executive coach and expert in helping tech companies calm the chaos in their growing organizations. Talked a lot about scaling, about when you should get a coach, about the types of challenges that people are dealing with today. Um, this is a fun one and definitely like hits home for all of us who are scaling anything and thinking about like, when should I be doing this totally myself or when should I be getting advice? So th that's what you can expect from our interview with Elizabeth that will be coming right up. Now, first, Sylvie, I mean, I was going to ask you what's got you talking to that, but I think I might just tell you what I, what's got me talking to Oh, you're today. that excited today. I'm pretty excited. You're not going to believe this. You're going to be completely shocked <laughs> oh by <my> AI. <laughs> no, actually, I'll... I'm having I, um, NFT deja vu. No. So I, the other day, I saw a few different people that I know sharing that Arnold Schwarzenegger has released like a daily email. Do you, did you see this? I haven't seen this. Okay. So the, the gubernator, is that what we call him? <laughs> <laughs> Um, he released this thing called Arnold's Pump Club, Lift Up the World. And it's basically this daily email that's like positivity around fitness and health. Okay. Okay. And I saw somewhere that he had like, this is, we're recording on April 5th. He has like 300,000 email subscribers or something. So I see this, then I see there's some podcast and it's rising the podcast chart. So as a podcaster, I'm interested, you know, yeah. what's going on with this podcast. Got to take a look. The first episode is three minutes long. Okay. So I'm like, I can listen to that. That's, that's not too long. That's doable. So I listened to it and about a minute and 35 into this thing, he says, I'm so busy. We've given my voice to the machines <laughs> and the machines are replicating my voice for me. And if, uh, if this doesn't work out, don't worry, I'll terminate it. And it turns out that he has a podcast that is 100% his AI voice. That's crazy. And it's already out there. I didn't notice this until he said it. And I shared it with some other people who didn't even, they listened to it. They didn't even, it didn't even click yet that like, this did is what happened. Did he say happening. it or did the machine say it? It's all the machine. It's all the machine. Yeah. It's, it's all like his voice cloned, yeah. which obviously has his permission. No, I was asking like a more existential, like, did he oh, say the machine it? it for him? Yes. Yeah. But I thought it was so crazy and so interesting because we're talking about these implications of AI. And then here is an example of it in the real world already. You know, there's been tools like Descript. We had Andrew Mason on the pod, talked a lot about huge fan of Descript. All these different things have voice cloning and stuff built in them that are mostly to fix errors or changes. But in this case, it's 100% created with his cloned voice. And he's telling you right up front, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not hidden. And yet this thing is super popular because obviously people want to consume it in this way and they'd like to hear Arnold explaining <laughs> this stuff. The whole thing's insane. <laughs> it and it's already, it's insane. basically, it's already here. It's already here is my point. All right. I'm excited to check it out. I'll report back. I do love yeah, I hope Terminator. I hope it I doesn't like blow your mind too much. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm nervous. I'm buckling up constantly. Uh, but what's got you talking too loud? Back to the original question that oh, I stopped myself from asking you. Yeah. Mine is way more wholesome. It's not okay. about machines mm -hmm. or Terminators. It's Passover, and I'm talking too loud about matzo ball soup, baby. Oh, yeah. That is the Jewish penicillin. My allergies have been going. I'm ready. I'm ready to just like... <laughs> throw dill and onions and carrots and celery and chicken and broth into a pot and slurp down that nice. goodness. That yeah. is your penicillin. This is what ails you, isn't it? This is it. This is it. <laughs> and, and I don't know, could a machine make it better than me? Maybe, maybe. 
but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go old yet. school. I'm gonna go old school, and That's I nice. take pride in it. You know, you take pride in it. Got take it. Pride in it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you found something <laughs> that uh, makes you feel good. And I hope our listener and our viewers can find something in this interview with Elizabeth that will make them feel good. Elizabeth, so good to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. It's great to see you guys, too. Thanks for having me. We have to start with the question we ask everybody, which is, what has you talking too loud these days? So I can't believe I'm actually going to admit this, but um, if you ask anybody in my family what has me talking too loud, it's birds. Okay. So, um, and this actually started um, like during the pandemic when all of a sudden, you know, at, for, for me, my kids are older. So when the pandemic happened and the kids started to stay home, it just meant that they slept later. And so I would be <laughs> in my house, it would be super quiet and I'd be sitting at my kitchen table, you know, kind of looking out the window with all this extra time on my hands. I know that like anybody who has small kids is probably not feeling that same situation, mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I just started noticing like all this stuff that was happening outside my window that I had never paid attention to ever. And so like over the years, it's just kind of morphed into this curiosity of like, you know, and, and starting to like figure out what bird is what and, you know, and the different patterns that they have in the different seasons. And um, so, yeah, so even my kids now, they kind of humor me and they're like, hey, what, you know, what that what's that one? Or, you know, they, they're starting to spot like, you know, woodpeckers and stuff like that. So, and do you keep a log of all the birds you've seen or do yeah, you like name them? Log. You know, what do you do? Sylvia, you like a bird log? I like a bird log. You do? <laughs> so, all right. So I have, so I, so someone else shares my kind of crazy curiosity around this. My, for Christmas one year, I got this like bird book. And so okay. I will, I do admit I go and I sort of figure out which one I spotted and I'll like, put a dot on it to know that like that I've seen that one, but. Okay. So you do yeah. track it. And then yeah, is there like a goal? Is there like a certain amount you're trying to see, or is it just fill the book or is it, is the journey its own reward? I think it's the, the journey is its own reward. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, so if the journey is its own reward, <laughs> let's talk about the journey of starting your own business and your own coaching practice. Like what, what has that been like? Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So actually it's four years ago this week that I started my practice. Um, and Congratulations. so thank you. Yeah. It's been, um, it's been a, a wild ride, you know, and I think as a solopreneur, it's, it's not exactly the same as having a complete sort of like tech startup experience, but, um, there are so many different parallels, um, of, my experience and what I've been going through. And, you know, it's, it's ironic that like I do a lot of coaching around the emotional roller coaster of running your business, you know, and I'm on that too, you know, like I experience those highs and lows all the time. And, um, so it's been so gratifying to be able to have designed a business that, um, is just in total alignment with what I love to do and with what I like to do in the world. And so from that perspective, it's amazing. And then the downside is that there are all these different aspects of running a company that are completely outside my comfort zone and that I have to learn as I go, but it's been, it's been cool. And what have been some of the, I mean, obviously it's, that's an interesting position to be in, to be running your own business and then helping other people run theirs and then helping them manage their highs and lows, which I'm sure are not timed to your own highs and lows. So like what have been some of the highs and lows recently? Is it my own personal highs and lows? Yeah. I think the, so my experience running a company, I, I was very fortunate to, um, when I first started out, like I kind of like, launched my website and, you know, started to do all the things. Um, and then within a couple of months, the first, um, founder that I worked with published a blog about the work that we did together. And so that generated all of my first clients, mm. which was That's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. 
Yeah. Um, and because the life cycle of my clients can be pretty long, like it's two and a half to three years for the company kinds of engagements that I do, it took me like three and a half years into, you know, into my business to kind of realize that, oh yeah, like there's an aspect to this business called business development and, you know, marketing and all the stuff that you guys are obviously an expert in. But I just, I didn't even have an appreciation really for the role that it played in my business because in the beginning it like came to me almost naturally. But my point around that is that it's, it's not entirely sustainable, right? Like I don't, I'd love to know a business that can do that without any type of you know, strategy around how you sort of put yourself out there to the world and help people understand who you are, you know? Yeah. I mean, as, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about like, um, you know, we've had times where it was easy growth, like kind of effortless. Like we would launch something and it would get a really good response. We launched something and get a good response and we just could kind of keep doing our thing and it would compound and more, more folks would come in, more stuff would happen. And then we've had times when we've taken some, you know, sometimes it's been we've taken a bigger risk. We've moved farther away from the core of what we're doing and something didn't work. And then you realize like, oh, that compounding that was happening in the background, like it's not happening as easily, you know? And so it's, it's an interesting challenge. I also imagine coaching people through the last three, four years has probably been, this is quite a time to go through that, right? Um, in terms of transition to COVID, you know, all these tech companies, wild growth, the zero interest rate phenomenon, um, to now like uh, very focused on costs, um, fundamentals. That's it. It's it. I mean, it's been a roller coaster in the macro level. So I imagine coaching through that has probably been quite a roller coaster. What was it felt like? It's been interesting. So in the very beginning, um, when and so in the like you know, COVID. That was what March of twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. And so at that point I had been in business for like nine months. And so I didn't even really have a baseline to know what to expect. And what's interesting with the startup space is that I think companies were um, impacted in all sorts of ways. And in some cases there were positive impacts, you know, um, there was, there was probably like that month or two where there was like the uncertainty and the unknown but then quickly, a lot of my clients ended up benefiting during that period for whatever reason, you know, like if it was a real estate company, you know, real estate started to boom and everybody needed, you know, a new real estate CRM and website, things like that. I think if anything, it's probably been in the last 18 months or so where some of those um, peaks have subsided and now other things are coming into play. But I think the other thing is for me, with the focus that I have, my my background and my expertise is on helping founders sort of calm the chaos in their companies during periods of fast growth. And so while there were definitely some unique situations in the last um, few years, the consistent theme of companies that I work with is that they're going through so much change and stress because they are a fast moving company where they're trying to figure out so many things, you know, as they're building a company around the product and the idea. So it's like by virtue of that, it just brings a level of challenge and complexity and stress. You know, and then on top of it, you have the compounding effect of like these huge unknowns um, that they also have to grapple with. I have two questions here. The first, the first thing is like, when, when do you think people should work with a coach? And then like intertwined with that, I think as you were talking about this, just like when you have a period of fast growth. And like, there's going to be some chaos. There's going to be some, you know, ch there's going to be a lot of change, right? You hire a ton of people, there's inherently change. There's more people to manage, there's more systems to build, there's things that can break, or you're tackling new problems you weren't tackling before. Like, how do those two things go together 
you know, how, how does it go together in terms of like, how do you manage the chaos? How can you stay calm as you scale? And then when do you think people need coaches? Should, should they always have coaches? Should they, you know, is there some way that is, if an entrepreneur is listening, they can ask, is there questions they can ask themselves to get a sense of like when someone from the outside might be helpful? That's a great question. Actually, I've been thinking about that uh, myself recently. Um, I was talking with a, one of my former CEOs that I worked with until they were acquired by a private equity firm. And so we were putting together, like I was interviewing him basically for the case study of the work that we had done over three and a half years. And he commented in that conversation that he said, you know, it's interesting that professional athletes, for example, it goes without saying that they're not going to have just like one coach. They're going to have multiple coaches for the different types of things that they're trying to work on. And I was thinking about that recently because, you know, they athletes, opera singers, whatever, you know, whoever is in the business of using themselves as the key asset, like they know it's important to optimize every part of who they are so that they can perform at their best. And so I think it's really important that if you're an entrepreneur, like you are your business's primary assets. And especially in the early days, you're probably like 80% of what your company is, you know, between you and your co-founder. So the question is when, when is the right time? I think it's um, when the founder becomes aware that what they're doing is not really meeting the need any longer. And that can be in so many different ways, right? So my focus is working with organizations. I've been working with leaders and teams for over 20 years. And so that's my specialty, right? My specialty is getting into a company and understanding what's really going on and what's causing the friction and then helping founders and their teams sort of work through that friction. My other sort of specialty is, is on that one-to-one -one coaching around mindset. And so if a founder is feeling like they're really struggling with managing their stress or the team is like people are at each other's throats or people are just going in a million different directions and they thought that they were super clear on what the decision was. Those are all signs that you could probably use some help in the kind of coaching that I do. But there, as you know, there's so many different kinds of coaches, which I think is what's problematic about even that term coach, right? Cause mm -hmm. it's so like broad and you get so many different kinds of um, skill sets and depth of expertise that it can be, I think it's, it's kind of problematic, you know, um, as a term, I think it can be really useful, especially for companies where, you know, you start off with an idea, right? And that idea becomes like a product and then you like build this team around it. And I'll use you, Chris, as an example, like without you and Brendan, think about probably for the first five to 10 years of your company, if you two weren't a part of that company, what would it be? Right. Yeah, no, totally. There's a, there's a lot of stuff in there that you just said that I think is like worth like double clicking on, you know, one is like, I totally agree at the beginning you can, it, ideas are free and easy, right? Like you look at Twitter, there's a million ideas and LinkedIn, like of like businesses that should be started and how AI is going to change everything, whatever, but actually doing it and getting into the, the thick of it and building the teams and the iteration and staying after both that comes down to people. And so we're talking about like the complexity that it is managing groups of people and as a founder, how you, or you work your way through that. And it's interesting, you know, I, I heard this term recently that I, I think will resonate with you, which is just like the corporate athlete. And I, I really liked it when I heard it because that what you've just said about coaching is something that I really believe, like you want to be the best at what you do. You would be crazy to imagine that like a tennis player, like Serena Williams doesn't have a coach. Of course she has a coach. She's the best, best in the world. She has a coach. This, the best and just lots of coaches. And, um, if you want to be really great, if you want to be world-class, like there's, it's pretty hard to do that without constantly learning and improving. It's pretty hard to do that without having you know a coach, I think like helping you or sometimes many coaches. 
And uh, certainly for me, in my experience, there's been moments of time I've had lots of different things, peer groups, leadership coaches, different executive coaches, coaches who helped with speaking, all these like different types of things. And it seems crazy to me if you're trying to grow and you have the funds and time to be able to bring someone on to help you, um, that if you can't increase the likelihood of success, like why, why wouldn't you do it? But it is, it is can sometimes it can be hard to, I think, to know which type of help to get or when to get it. Right. Like, do you bring somebody, is it someone, should there be someone on your team who's helping you in every moment? But like that inherently is a different relationship because they're on your team. Is it someone who's just helping you? Is it someone who's helping you in your role at the business? Is it a group of peers that's going through similar things that like has no state? Like thinking through that, I think is like really an interesting challenge to get right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that all of those can be helpful at different times um, and maybe even sometimes at the same time, right? And then again, you have you have like the marketing coach and the sales coach and the, you know, the kind of general coach. So it is, it's, it's kind of, it's hard if you're a founder to know which way to turn. I think my bias is always, because I've, I've actually worked internally at companies for a long time, having somebody outside of your company is usually a lot more effective because then you're not dealing with any kind of like power dynamic or, you know, you can really count on somebody to be more objective because they, they just don't have the same kind of relationship that, yeah. that you'd have with somebody who's, you know, like, let's say, you know, somebody who's in your company and who you're, you know, you're paying their salary and, and inherently there is sort of something tied up in job security and, you know, it's hard to be totally honest sometimes um, about really hard things when um, those types of things are at risk, potentially. What are you seeing as the common challenges that leaders are having to navigate today? And do you think that they're different than they were four or five years ago? I mean, I think that it, it, in part, it depends on if you're bootstrapped or if you're VC backed. I think for sure, if you're a company that's relying on investment, a lot has changed and it's been a huge wake up call. Um, and that has put a lot of pressure on how leaders run their company and what they focus on and whether they, you know, what they feel like they have the bandwidth or the luxury to do. Um, but if you're like a bootstrapped company, I think the way that I see it, I look at, I look at companies as like a system, right? And it's it almost like if you look at, if you look at like a family dynamic, any family, right? Every family is different with different personalities, but there are a lot of things thematically that, that happen regardless. And that's sort of how I see for, for the majority of the companies that I work with, they go through very similar growing pains, very similar stages. There's a lot that they share in common. Um, and I don't think that that's really changed because, you know, you made a good point, Chris, earlier that like at the end of the day, it's about people and people's behaviors and the way that we kind of like organize around groups that's just human nature and that doesn't really change it's interesting to hear the difference and it makes sense that that's what you're saying the difference between bootstrapped companies and ones that have raised a lot of funding and obviously the screws have been turned up for everybody who's raised funding and the expectations have shifted and it is interesting like i think a lot about getting the team right and then once you have a right, you need to not screw that up. <laughs> so like, it's like, if you have the right dynamics, if you have, if you have high trust, if you work on the right thing, you know, you can basically change anything to get to that point. And then once you're at that point, like, how do you maintain it? And then as you scale, you know, it's going to break. That's one of, I think the hardest things for entrepreneurs to deal with is like knowing you're going to have to break systems that are working, usually that involve people to get to the next level. Yes. And I, I'd love to know, like when you feel like those moments hit for Wistia, I find, um, so I'd love, like, I'd love 
um, to hear if you think this is right on your side, but like I find that like every time a company sort of doubles in size, whatever that number is, mm -hmm. like you go from six to 12, right? That's not a huge number, but what you have to do to align 12 people is completely different than what you had to do when you had like six people who yes. you could basically like read each other's minds, right? Yes. And then 12 to 24, 24 to 48, like each one, each time it doubles, it's like you've got to just kind of go back to the drawing board and reset and figure out, okay, what's needed now at this size. I think for sure that's, that's what I have seen. And in the early days when we were going from six to 12, I remember thinking, like, can I even, can I run a business with 12 people? I don't know. Like, can I, I can do this at six, but like, can I do it? And then we'd get to 12 and a bunch of stuff would break and a bunch of stuff would be better. And over time, one thing I realized was that basically we never wrote all these things down because to your point, like we felt like we were sitting around one table. So you didn't, we're just all in sync. Like in the earliest days, some customer would call, we'd all be able to hear the call and we'd hear what they're complaining about. And there would be implications from it. It would be implications of the website and the product. And so the cycle of learning is so rapid and fast. And then as you had more people and systems and org structure and what have you, like every, we kept having to write down more stuff, what our culture is, what characteristics we look for in hiring, what we expect in reviews, like, you know, and, and that's still true actually, as we keep getting bigger, there's, there's these things that are still kind of known and then, but they're, they're known implicitly and we have to make them explicit. Right. Um, and I, I think one thing we've kind of done to try to make that easier, that scaling process is hire a bunch of people in an area and then hold steady for some period of time to actually improve how we work. And we used to do this really explicitly. We're like, all right, we're going to hire. We haven't hired for four months. We're going to hire four people. We're going to now we're going to be 18 or whatever. And then we're going to not hire for three months or some period of time. And we'd do that and we'd check in on how things were working. We'd update some systems and keep going. And that's kind of what happened to us last year and the year before. We hired enormously and then we've held the line more. And like, there's certain teams that they're not changing. And it's remarkable to see a team that is the same exact people, same size, same, you know, ownership over part of the product or, you know, part of the customer experience. And then by not changing and by just focusing on, iterations and improvement that go faster and faster. And also like the insight to everything else becomes more impactful, but it's just like, and so then knowing that when we go through that again, we're going to break a bunch of stuff is like, it's like, you know, it's a necessary part of growing, but it is, it's a hard thing to do. It is hard. What do you think leaders should do to, to navigate those doubling periods? Well, the thing that just came to mind when you were talking was, you know, this term change management. And so, so I'm not sure how familiar, you know, you are with, with like the discipline around that, but give it, um, give it to us. Yeah. I'm not. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, I've been using a model for years. It's by like ProSci and the, it's an acronym, um, and it's called the ADCAR. And so when you think about change and getting people through it, you have to step them through each of these phases like in sequence in order to actually make change stick. So the first A is awareness. So are they aware of what needs to change? Let's say you have a team that, you know, you've maybe introduced like a new process to, you know, and said like, this is going to be the new standard or what have you. Right. So the first thing that they need to know is that like, this is the new standard or process or whatever that we're going to follow. The second one in the process is the D is desire. So do they want to make that change? Do they want to adapt to that new process? And if you haven't been able to achieve, like sort of check the box on like, do they have that desire? Then you can't really move to the next step, right? Cause you're going to be stuck with people being like, yeah, but I don't like, my way is the, the thing that I've been doing for the last five years is working for me. Why would I want to change that? Right? So you're never really going to get that, that behavior change if, um, you haven't solved for that. So you've got to kind of like work that phase until you feel like, okay, you know, the people who need to 
be on board or now on board. So then you move to the K, which is knowledge. So now do they know how to do that new process? Like what do they need to know? What do they need to be trained on? Whatever, right? And then the next um, A is ability. So they know how, so they are aware of what needs to change. They care about changing and they're on board with changing. They know how to change. Do they have the ability to change? Um, and I see this a lot with leadership um, in fast growth companies where, you know, what you could do as a leader in a company, you know, where you had maybe five direct reports is different from now what you would need to do now that you have a team of 20 to 25. That ability piece can sometimes just legitimately be hard to kind of overcome or achieve. And so th that's why I think we sometimes see at certain phases of companies where people will shift in roles based on their, you know, based on what they're kind of able to do. And then the last um, phase of that uh, acronym is the R, which is reinforcement. So now that you've, people know what the new, you know, process needs to be, they care about changing, they know how to do it, they're able to do it. Now, you know, what's the sort of reinforcement mechanism to make sure that they stick with that change over time? Yeah. So it's, as you were saying that, especially as the example of going from five to 25, it's very, very easy to underestimate the systems and process you need in place to get it to feel like it did when it was five. You know, I think about that a lot in terms of like getting through those moments, like we should feel, and I think this is true for us today is like, it feels very much like it did in the earliest days. But if you showed me the process and systems and the way that we do stuff today, to me of like when I was like 24 and you know, we we're just like four people, I wouldn't have believed any of it. Like I, I would have been like, nope, that's not us. That's not me. That's not how you do it. And it's been this interesting kind of journey of realizing that a lot of these systems, like what you're talking about with ADCAR are what allow you to have a group unified. Right. And, um, if you can do that, then within the right constraints that you create, people can be just as creative, even more creative than they were beforehand. I feel like I'm having a weird epiphany right now, which is that, you know, I am a freelance producer and it's hard to freelance period, but from the leadership perspective, I'm just thinking like, how do you create that sort of unity when you have freelancers who are constantly like onboarding and offboarding? Um, I see a lot of companies who have freelancers. They just sort of treat them like their team. Um, there is no delineation, which is, which is I think a difference between um, startup culture and like corporate culture, you know, like if you're in like a big corporation and you're a freelancer, there's like this wall, right? Where you get treated differently and they think of, you know, different legal reasons why that needs to be the case. I see a lot in startups that they're just part, you know, in fact, I'll do, when I do workshops with teams, they'll often, you know, include their freelancers in those workshops, like on, Hey, who do we, what do we want this company to be? You know, when, when we do like core values, you know, workshops, they're a part of it. Like their voice is as important as someone who is like a paid full-time employee. Yeah. And I would say for us and like, there's definitely areas where we spin the amount of effort into something up and down. And so that's where that we end up having more freelancers is, you know, something where it's just like, oh, we might need 20 people on this for three weeks and then we'll go back to needing three. And I would echo like the, be it works best when people have the most context of all the things we're trying to do and understand our goals and what's working and what's not and have access to the data and are fully trusted. And I think one of the major advantages for freelancers is when we can free them of some of the infrastructure also. So it's like, we want you to know everything and we all don't want you to have to worry about reviews and we don't want you to have to worry about all these other things. And so hopefully that means that you can charge ahead without having to worry about this other stuff. And I think a lot of people do that where it's like a lot of companies spin up freelance help because they think that this help won't be as distractible. And I think there are lots of advantages to that. But then the challenge becomes like, how do you balance your growth for everybody? And what are they looking for? 
you know, and I think that that's where it gets like complicated for me. It's like, you know, when someone's on the team, they're having a different type of conversation. They're looking at different type of projects differently inherently, and that can be incredibly good, but also on certain things, like we actually want people to be more focused. And so, and for the freelancer, obviously everyone has different things they want in their life. Um, you know, so, but it is an interesting question because a, a lot of companies, I think when they scale really fast, that is their answer is like, let's just right. hire like crazy. Like, and, like, and they end up hiring freelancers because often because they can't even hire people fast enough. Yeah. And so the, I, I think one of the most important things is wherever you can connect them into your strategy and your vision, just like they're a regular employee, it gives people meaning um, for their work, but it also helps them tap into the work in a much more kind of like dialed in way. As you were saying that, I was just thinking, it's like, and everyone's just human. Like we yeah. want to know what we're working on and why, right? Like someone just gives you a task to do and you don't know why you're doing it. It's pretty hard to d do it. Like, you know, you, maybe you get paid enough that it's okay. But I, I feel like it's just like, we're all human beings. Everyone has different reasons why they're working in certain ways or companies can afford different things or whatever. But like, that's to me, what's like resonating out of what you're saying is like, Context. all right, so how do you, yeah, yeah. You just have to bring people in and tell them the why's and yeah. then like tell them why the why's are changing. And, you know, hopefully that's like exciting and engaging, but it is a challenge. I mean, it's interesting because I don't, we got to this place. It's like almost like there's executive coaching. So it's coming in and helping a leader. And then now we're talking about like, not, not, not executive coaching, but like freelancing and help. And how do you get that to work well? And they're both similar in some ways and different in some ways. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how you can lead effectively when you're managing freelancers yes it's all yeah it's it's all interesting <laughs> it is it's just it it's interesting too because like back to calmness like how do you keep an organization calm how do you do it and i i think one thing that's like just really been on my mind is like and we talked about this already but you know you're gonna grow you know you're gonna do a new thing that inherently means you're going to break some systems or you're going to, you know, even just reform teams. Um, we've talked before about like forming, storming, ignoring, performing of like you need to form that whole thing. And you know, that's going to happen. So you basically know you're going to have to storm. And then how do you, how do you storm? Do you just storm quickly? Do you have better values to help you storm less? You know, and I think there's, at least it was my experience is like, there's not one easy answer on this, which is, which is like tough. I wish there was. That's such a great question. Um, so I heard a few, I heard you say a few things in the way you run your company where you're doing that, right? So creating pauses after hiring, you are in like, you're, it's like you're intuitively, you intuitively know all right, now this team needs time to just settle and go through that um, process so that we can get them, you know, kind of like humming along quickly. So that's, that's just one thing I want to point out that you seem to be doing naturally, you know, whether it's intentional or not for that reason. The other thought that I have around this is, especially for companies where there is a very specific, like, dynamic. So I, you know, I think of one company where they're, they're trying really hard to figure out something that no company has figured out yet. And so the level of like innovation, creativity, problem solving, and healthy tension that's required in order to make that happen, um, is like really high. And so that's all great. But when you have a lot of people who have a lot of strong opinions and, you know, there can be like fiery debates all the time, bringing somebody new into a team like that can be challenging. And so I often will work with teams around those situations where, okay, like how can we, how can we bring to light what's going on here and what's causing that? And oftentimes it comes down to the stories that we tell ourselves about the situation that we're in, right? And so something new is happening. I'm feeling uncomfortable. You're feeling uncomfortable. In the absence of sort of open communication, I'm going to kind of go internal and start to think about why this situation is happening. And 
I am just going to sort of subconsciously create an interpretation of what I think is happening, which is probably based on my beliefs and past experiences and, you know, the way that I interpret the world. And that that's happening to every single person on the team. And so the quicker you can kind of surface everyone's beliefs about what's happening in this moment, the faster you're going to accelerate through that period of chaos. And are you saying that in that case, like basically admitting and being proactive upfront that, hey, we are going to go like this is a team that is has super high trust and therefore to maintain that we need to really proactively when we're bringing people in, try to get in front of it. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's important for every team. And you, you also, I'm going to get again, point to something that you mentioned earlier too, which is like, you know, that you know exactly what's going to happen. And you know, when you take certain actions in your company and, and by the way, I would love to know kind of like when in your trajectory in the, you know, 16 or so years that you've had this company, like when did that start to click for you? Cause that's clearly, you see that you know, really clearly with your company and you, you know, in advance, like, oh, we're going to add these five people and that's going to break it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, yeah, that can like lend itself to anxiety because you know, you know, it's going to get uncomfortable and you know that it's going to cause um, some chaos, but just the awareness that it's going to happen allows you to start planning more deliberately for, to get the team through that. Yeah. I think, you know, to answer your question, I, it's been probably in the last like four years or so, five years, somewhere in there that I started to actually see that, that like, oh, this is disruptive. You know, there's like, there's a thing that I was dealing with yesterday and I was in a meeting. I heard some news. I'm like, we can solve this but like this will be disruptive and this will be disruptive to a bunch of people and the implications of it will be large. So getting in front of it is like really important to make it so that, oh, when we actually solve this, like it's the distance between what we're doing today and what it will take to do this thing that we want to do is actually pretty small in the right light. So that's what I have to focus on. But yeah, it's, it is something that just kind of happened and actually the other side of it, I will say to your point, like it gives me much more confidence that we can just scale and get through these things because it's like, oh, well, we've done this a bunch. Like, yes, I understand how this works. Like this is going to be chaotic at first and then we're going to figure out the new way of working. And, you know, it's, it is nice to have that tool set because it, it does, I think, get us to a calmer place faster, but I still will tell you like, you know, in terms of percentage headcount growth right now, this year is much less than the last two years. And it is easily much more calmer just naturally. And it's weird, actually. I've talked to some other entrepreneurs who are having a really hard time right now. And they're like, man, it sucks to be an entrepreneur today. Like, this is a shitty time to be an entrepreneur. I feel bad saying it. it doesn't feel like that. Like, there's a lot of hard stuff. But, like, I'm mostly, it actually feels calmer and, and easier, which is weird. And I just, I kind of look at it. I'm like, is this just because I've done this so long? Like, I don't know. I can't, I don't, I don't know anymore, but I, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you've been very thoughtful and intentional. Part of that comes with time for sure. You know, and, and the wisdom around like what works, what doesn't, what causes, what contributes to the chaos that I can mitigate. Yeah one other kind of just sort of like from a tool perspective around change is planning, right? Like who are the people who need to know what and how do we sequence that in a way that's going to minimize noise as opposed to create noise, you know? So just taking like, an hour to put together, you know, the 10 things that you want to do in the particular order so that the right people know at the right times that can go a long way in keeping things drama free when it comes to change. Yeah. That's also one where if you have other people who don't think the same way as you, it increases the chance that the planning's good. 
And um, speaking of that, people who don't think the same way as me, Sylvie here <laughs> has come up with a segment for us, uh, which we're calling Executive Coaching Mad Libs. Is that right, Sylvie? That's what we're calling it. Okay. So we're going to try something a little different. I'm going to read the first part of the sentence, and then I would love for you to finish it by filling in the blank. Sound good? Let's do this. <laughs> okay. If you're experiencing burnout, you should blank. Think about what values might be in misalignment. If your team is dealing with a lot of conflict, you should start by looking at the story you're telling yourself about that situation. Oh, I like that. I like okay, that. here we go. We got a couple more. If you're struggling to make a decision, you should try to get input from knowledgeable people and then sleep on it. Sleep Perfect. on it. Love that. If your company is going through growing pains, you should definitely not pull a lot of all nighters. Yes. There we go. Yes. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. This was so much fun. And bearing with us as we try all these different things. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. I love experimenting. And I think, you know, as we were talking, especially at the end, I'm, I'm like ready to get into all the specifics of Wistia with you. So you can coach me. Well, we won't, we won't bore everybody with that, but um, thank you so much. Where can people connect with you to learn more? I do a lot of, I do a lot of writing and I'm also um, making videos on LinkedIn and um, my website is elizabethoneal.com or they can email me at elizabeth at elizabethoneal.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us and, so and sharing so much about coaching and team building and staying calm through the craziness. Yeah, no problem. Great to see you. Great to see you too. Very chill convo in there. Very chill. So calm. She calmed all my chaos. Yeah, I wonder how much of her coaching is just helping people feel calm. <laughs> I I mean, I do think that's a factor, right? It's like For sure. You got Yeah, I think that yes, it's a real factor. Well, it's also just you can have a sense, I think, you know, when I think back to some of the coaches I've had over the years and I've gone to them with like you know, things that were stressing me out. Obviously, like if they have a, an idea for how to work through that thing and they calmly tell you about it, it does actually help you manage the situation more calmly. Like, I think that's real. I think that's very real. And, you know, I think she said during the interview, like, I think you were asking about when is it time to get a coach or like when you might benefit from having a coach as opposed to, you know, talking to a peer or somebody else in your organization. Just like having that outside eye and being able to kind of bring – a new perspective that a leader might not be able to see because they're so mired in the stress or the chaos or the growth or the whatever you name it. Having that outside perspective just feels pretty invaluable. It definitely is. I mean, having people who have seen it before or haven't, but they know you really well and they can guide you a little bit. I mean, that's what a coach is, right? It's just like, it's, it's funny to think that like, as we were talking about in the interview, there's a weird thing with like outside of sports, most people don't think about having a coach. Yeah. When the truth is you want to be world-class at anything, you're going to have a coach. That's how, that's how it works. And like, and someone who's watching how you're doing your job can give you feedback and input on it. And it, it adds up if you take all that feedback over time and, you really have a trusted relationship and you believe the feedback that the coach is giving you, it adds up to a really big impact. It's so true. It's so true. And I don't know, I feel like people kind of white knuckle it, especially in the business space. They're like, I should be able to do this. But even like that acronym that she went through, ADCAR, mm -hmm. like there are so many leadership skills that you need to implement all 
those things. Like you need to be an effective communicator so that people have knowledge. You need to be a motivator so that people are persuaded to like make the change. There are just so many, so many different skill sets that as a leader, you need to be doing all at once. Like, of course you would need a coach for that. Of course. Yeah. And I think it's also, I, we didn't really say this in there, but you need, ideally you would get a coach, I think during a comp period. That's the other thing I would say. That's interesting. Because I think like, you know, when I've sought out lots of outside advice, usually seek out the advice when you have a problem. Right. But the challenge is like, you're in the middle of a problem. So you probably want to solve the problem rapidly. They may not have all the context and everything that's going on. And, it, and it's, I do think it's like, it's like the person who's a runner and they decide they're already pretty fast. And like, I actually think I need a running coach. And like, would that help me? And then they go get a running coach and like, now they're actually totally changing how their training is going and whatever. Um, why am I talking about running? I don't know. But because <laughs> uh, I did today, I guess. I just wanted to tell everyone I go. went for a little run. You just wanted um, a humble brag. Just, yeah, I ran. That's my brag. <laughs> Wasn't fast. I can tell you that. <laughs> but like the idea of getting a coach before you need one, just like having an advisor at the ready or having a mentor, like it's actually when it isn't chaos is when you need the person. And that's also what help can help you avoid the chaos. But it's hard to think that always. Um, and I, I think it's a good, it's a good thing even for me to reflect on like where, where do I need more of those types of things in my life? I love it. Cool. Well, keep calm, keep calm and carry on and hire a coach is what I was going to say. Oh, and hire a coach. Yeah. I was just going off that. The you know, t-shirt. The I got you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <laughs> keep calm audience. Thanks for sticking with us. Please rate and review the show uh, wherever you listen to it or watch it. Now, of course, if you want to help more people discover it, a nice uh, positive review. They're all positive. Uh, would be great. <laughs> if you have feedback, please send us feedback at ttlpod at .com. You can find Sylvia and I on LinkedIn um, at our names. Lots of conversation happening there and we hope to hear from you. And I think that about wraps it up. Bye-bye. <laughs>